Today, more data triangulation points. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Last week we discussed a raft of data points which showed how weak the economy is going into the current crisis. Despite ScoMo's we were doing fine until the health crisis hit thematic in his speech today, that's the good old plausibility deniability routine, the fact is we were underwater before the latest events, thanks to poor policy. The latest tranche of data spells out things quite well. First, there was more confirmation that China's economy is slowing, as their producer prices in February fell 0.4% from a year earlier, according to official data just released, swinging back into deflationary territory as the outbreak hit business activity. Analysts had expected a producer price index to fall 0.3% from a year earlier, compared with 0.1% rise in January. And consumer prices rose 5.2% from a year earlier versus a 5.4% increase in January and a 5.2% rise tipped by economists in the poll. So the China lockdown in Wuhan and some cities in Hubei province, the epicentre of the outbreak, and imposed restrictions in other cities to contain the spread from late January is really taking its toll. The measures likely led to a major slowdown in the world's second largest economy in the first quarter, analysts are saying. The question is, of course, how far? And the Aussie dollar hardly moved on the news and is currently sitting at 65.59. Then locally, first today we got the NAB business survey. Both confidence and conditions fell this month after a period of stabilisation in conditions, though it appears too early to fully quantify the effect of the current medical crisis, with around 50% of firms reporting no impact to date. That is surprisingly small, but in our view will clearly deteriorate going forward, they said. Even so, confidence is now firmly negative and business conditions appear to have renewed its previous downward trend, with both series well below long-run averages. More importantly, forward orders deteriorated significantly and is quite negative, while the deterioration in the survey is not as large as we had feared, they said. The notable decline in personal confidence over the past two months a decline in exports and the overall softening in forward orders, in part reflecting in weaker confidence, are all areas that should have been expected to show. More broadly, the survey continues to suggest ongoing softness in the business sector with conditions and confidence having tracked below average for some time and capacity utilisation hovering around average in recent months. And this has been reflected in reported capex falling to a below average level after trending lower over the past 18 months or so. The employment index ticked up in the month and is back around its long-run average despite the ongoing weakness in confidence, trading conditions and profitability. However, while it remains a bright spot in the survey, it too has moderated and implies a significantly slower pace of growth in employment when compared with 2018 and early 2019. So NAB is pretty negative on business. And ANZ confirmed our recent household surveys with a report that consumer confidence fell 4.2% last week. This was the third consecutive fall for a cumulative decline of more than 8%, taking the index to a low last seen in May 2014. Current economic conditions fell 8%, adding to the massive 16.6% decline in the previous region. Future economic conditions bucked the trend, however, with a rise of 1.7%, so somebody knows something, or is not taking the current situation seriously. And something weird is happening to the mortgage market, judging by the bevy of messages I've received in the past few days. Lenders, including those from the big four, have made a provisional commitment loan for a property transaction and then have pulled the pin before the final commitments are made. In some cases, the loan now is being priced higher than indicated, despite the rate cuts. And in other cases, they just turned around and said no. 
at least two DFA followers have been left high and dry and are trying to sort alternative financing at very short notice. Now that may just be a glitch, or this could be something more significant given the rising funding costs that we're seeing in reaction to the global market uncertainties, a sign perhaps that the mortgage market could be freezing up. For those with a property transaction in train, it's worth checking the small print if you have a mortgage ready to go. Be sure it is fully unconditional, else you may be caught short. Conditional loans are just that. And if you've experienced this recently, let me know, because this is something I need to monitor. And we also had new data today from the Australian Financial Complaints Authority, or AFCA, which showed that complaints about home loans have increased by 20% in the last six months of 2019. The data shows that CBA and Westpac have the largest proportion of complaints, with the CBA group at 890 and Westpac at 639. This increase has been driven by financial firms failing to respond to requests for assistance, the conversion of loans from interest only to principal and interest, and issues with responsible lending, they said. Credit card complaints were at 2,750 in the same period, and the Financial Services Ombudsman received 2,201 complaints about home loans, and that's 367 per month on average. And to home prices, but in New Zealand, Westpac New Zealand has released analysis on the economic impacts of the virus, which forecasts that New Zealand's current rampant housing market will, quote, skid to a halt over the second quarter. However, it will rebound from 2021, they say, as monetary stimulus bites. The currently rampant housing market is likely to skid to a halt with price growth slowing sharply in the June quarter. That, combined with job losses and lower farm and business incomes, will have a secondary impact on consumer spending that could last longer than the immediate disruption from the virus, they said. The Reserve Bank will be keen to ensure that it does not fall too far out of sync with its peers, lest the exchange rate rise unhelpfully. The consequence of this monetary easing will be even more stimulus for the housing market once the disruption from the virus has passed. Both our house price inflation forecasts and our economic growth forecasts have been reduced in the short run, they said, but increased from 2021 onwards. And they conclude we expect house prices to lift further in February, but we think that after that, the housing market will lose momentum in the coming months as buyer caution outweighs any further drop in mortgage rates. And I think we can read that across to Australia and I agree on the timing with the biggest falls emerging as we approach winter. But I would beware the bull trap because there are still people out there talking up the property market as a safe alternative to the stock markets. And the stock market fell on opening, but is now up. So it will be interesting to see whether the recovery holds to the close of business. It's worth bearing in mind that in a bear market, we often get wild volatility and some upward days rather than a straight series of falls in every session. The fundamental issue is that markets cannot determine underlying value of any stocks at the moment because the outlook is so uncertain. And tomorrow the US will be announcing their response package, which includes some changes to payroll tax and other measures designed to prop up the economy there. We'll have to wait longer for the Aussie version, which is coming at some point. Meanwhile, the falling oil price is already putting pressure on US shell producers, many of whom are highly leveraged and would be finding the going tough. US shale drillers are already facing substantial hurdles with cash flow problems and maturing debt. Shale stocks tanked in the US on Monday, with big names in shale, such as EOG Resources, Whiting, Continental Resources and Apache, all down over 30%. But one of the biggest was Occidental Petroleum, which has seen its market capitalization shrink to $15 billion. It paid $38 billion for Anadarko, and shares are off roughly 73% since that deal. There will be many bankruptcies in this industry, which could lead to tens of thousands of layoffs over the next 12 months. And in fact, the question is becoming not which economies will go into recession, but rather which economies manage to avoid a recession. The eurozone is a pretty sure bet to shrink and others are on the same train. This will not be pretty. And so we'll keep tracking the data and reporting it as events continue to emerge. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.